If you could change your last name to some kind of weird name, not necessarily weird even, but a name that would have to be bleeped if somebody said it on TV, <laughs> what would you change it to? Wait, are we changing it to a name that would have to be bleeped or yes. the alternative? Yes, no, it's not going to be like, my name's David Riedel, and then you bleep Riedel. It's like, <laughs> my name, my name's Davey Dildo. So what, you know... <laughs> And that's just because the alliteration is magical. So what would Davey you guys Dildo? choose? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I this is not my original creation, but I am partial. And it's not a last name, but I am partial to Tits McGee. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, I knew, I knew a woman in grad school whose last name was Gee and everyone called her <gasps> McGee. Everyone called her Tits McGee. <laughs> The poor thing. Like, I never Aww. did because I was just like, I can't. I cannot do that. But. I just love it because I know I've said it before, but I'm Veronica Corningstone. Tits McGee is on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great oh, one. That yeah. might be my favorite. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so That's good. a good one. But Evan, what about you? Obviously yes. not Tits McGee. We were watching the end credits for The Wretched earlier. And no joke. This was someone's name in the credits. Porn. Some Eric no, Porn. I got, I got it, but I got, got one better because oh. I did notice Eric Porn in the credits. <laughs> There's a guy whose name was Tug Cocker. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The for real. The only way that could be better if his name was Cock Tugger. I mean. <laughs> Are we Let's talking leave. about Tug Coker? Oh yeah, it, it, yeah, it's Coker. <laughs> but I Is like that really? you went with Cocker. <laughs> Evan got it. <laughs> yeah, it's Tug Coker. Yeah, he was on The uh, Office, and he's on Mixed well, Dish. <laughs> that's too bad. <gasps> I mean, it, maybe it's Cocker. I, I think knows? that he should he change it to Tug way. Cocker. <laughs> wow. Yes. Oh my God. That's that's. He's in a show that's called that's Now We're Talking, and I think they should change up. it to Now We're Tugging. <laughs> oh my god somewhere in the middle of arizona you painted a desert and called it my home you made it welcome to spoiler peace theater the podcast that doesn't give a shit about spoilers we just want to talk about the movies my name is evan crean i am co-chair of the boston online film critics association and i'm co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living my name is megan kearns a freelance writer editor of bitch flicks and i too am a member of the boston online film critics association my name is dave riedel i am also a member of the boston online film critics association yeah, you are. <laughs> uh, we have more than a few movies to talk about, so I think we should get to it. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, Bean Pole. We are going to be talking about Bad Education, which unfortunately is not a Joan Jett song. <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking about Deer Skin, and we're going to be talking about The Wretched. So, we sure are. We're going to start with Bean Pole which is a film that Megan has seen and she watched (laughs) today. And it was, uh, it was something I heard. (laughs) It is something. And let me tell you to start off with this uh, film is, is also something. Um, So I have to start off by saying this is a beautifully made, beautifully crafted film. Um, It is also ridiculously bleak and devastating and depressing. Um, This film is about two women in Russia, in Leningrad specifically, now obviously St. Petersburg, Leningrad at the time. Um, It takes place after World War II. And it is all about how war has just devastated everyone's lives. And Mm -hmm. it opens with this woman um, named Ia, who is, you hear these, like, even before you see anything on screen, you hear these kind of, like, sort of, like, choking sounds, like, like almost, like, hard having a hard time swallowing or choking or something, and you see this woman who is frozen, and apparently you hear other people talking around her, and she has these, like, spells, if you were, 
where she gets frozen and doesn't say anything, can't move, can't communicate, can't do anything. And you later find out much later in the film that it's due to a concussion. And Ooh. yeah. So yikes! within the first like 10, 15 minutes, you find, you find out that she has a little boy and he's adorable and she works in a hospital for, um, for veterans and she has to take the little boy to work sometimes and she lives in like a boarding house with other people and she's you see her commuting to work on a tram and like everyone's crowding onto the to the trolley before the sun's risen so you you get a sense of her life that this is a very difficult experience obviously and you <laughs> this is one of the most horrific scenes i've ever seen in a film Oh yeah. boy. Brace yourself. It it is it is horrible. Um she's playing with her son and they're like he's like pulling on her and they're like kind of like sort of wrestling and she's on top of him and she has one of her frozen moments and she's crushing him and he's like mommy stop stop and you see there's a close up on his little arm and his little tiny hand like trying to push her off Obviously, it's a futile gesture, and then the arm stops moving, and he's dead. And it is so like Whoa. I'm just like, it, and this is like in the first 15 minutes, and I'm like sobbing, and I'm like, I can't watch this movie, and I did watch it, but I was like, holy fuck, this movie is so brutal and so sad, and we're already dealing with child death, like oh my god, yeah. And so then. After that, this woman, Masha, shows up, who is a longtime friend of Ia, and you find out pretty quickly that she's actually the mother of the little boy who died. And she keeps asking, like, oh, where's Pashka? That's the name of her son. And she's like, where's Pashka? How's he doing? Has he gotten big? Is he still really small? And, like, the woman, Ia, has just, like, she can't, like, she's, she just can't get the words out. She can't tell her that her child is dead. And... You find out, like, she was on the front lines of the battle and she was sending home food. And then finally, because Ia looks like she's about to, like, have a breakdown, she finally asks her, is Pashka dead? And she says yes. So from that point on, the whole film is basically about the two of them living together. Mashka, um, or Masha is now working at the hospital along with Ia. And so they work together. They live together. And it's all basically how Masha is obsessed, obsessed with having another baby so she can heal from this trauma. And she – you find out that – because she thinks she's pregnant because she has sex with a guy and she you so, and she's obsessed with the notion that she's pregnant. But then you find out through a doctor's appointment because she's like throwing up and she's like, maybe I'm pregnant. And the doctor's like, uh, you know about your surgeries – you know there's no way you could be pregnant. And it's like, wait, what? And she had some, like, you find out she had, like, shrapnel. She has a scar on her abdomen, and you find out it's from shrapnel. And so she is completely infertile and cannot have children. So it's like, Jesus Christ, this is also depressing. And so she tries to convince Ia to get pregnant and give her the baby. And Ia doesn't want to do this. And so, Whoa. yeah, it's like, oh, my God, it's just, like, one thing after another. And then – that also leads to one of the most horrifying sex scenes I've ever seen in my life where – Oh, my God. Yeah, where Ia agrees to have sex with uh, her boss and Masha's there next to them and she's like, I'm not going to do this if you don't stay with me. And so Ia is like sobbing her face off and Masha's like next to her like facing away and it's just horrifying. It's so awful. Um and I mean, and the, this is basically what the film is about, is about how bleak their lives are. And towards the, actually almost right at the end of the film, Masha, or in the meantime, she's gotten a boyfriend and she, the boyfriend wants to marry her. So she goes to his house um, where his parents live and his parents live in this like huge rich mansion. And the mother is like grilling her um, on her life and what her life was like and Throughout the film, like, we knew that Masha and Ia knew each other because they – Masha says that they worked together on anti-gunning anti, anti -gunning, um, 
craft or like anti-gunning aircraft or something. They worked, they basically did something on the front lines together. And, but that's not actually necessarily what happened, or maybe that's partially what happened, but that's not the full story. And we find out the full story is that Masha was prostituting herself or attaching herself sexually to other soldiers so she could survive, so she would have food, so she would have protection. And she says unprotected women don't survive or they can't survive. And she says to the mother, she's like, you would never make it there because no one would want you, (laughs) which is like, oh, my God. And the woman says to her, she's like, well, actually, you and I are not so different. She's like, you don't know what we've had to do to survive, too. And she's like, she's like, you seem like a great person. She's like, I don't want you to be with my son because he's just going to use you and dump you. And it's like, oh, this kind of takes an interesting turn. So then she goes back to Ia and they live together. Um, but so that's basically the film in a nutshell. And the film is, even though it is so bleak and so depressing, it it is punctuated with these sweet moments between the two women. And the film is really anchored by their very touching friendship and their reliance on each other in order to get through these extremely horrifying times. And that's nice to see. And visually, this is stunning. And throughout the entire film, which is kind of not interesting, but kind of I I enjoyed seeing this. There's a color palette of every single scene has green in it and like very vibrant Kelly green. There's also a lot of red, but it's, it's very interesting to see kind of creative uses of injecting that color. Like there's one scene where Ia is walking and she has um, a load of um, logs and then she has like a green pine needle like branch and that's the infusion of green. And so it's just kind of Hmm. it's it's, and it's very beautifully um, filmed and it's incredibly well acted. So that's why I say this is incredibly well-crafted piece of film and it is definitely how, like I said, the, about how these women lean on each other to get through their lives are filled with trauma. And it is about how people navigate their PTSD and their trauma and these these horrifying circumstances. And the director said that he was inspired um, to make this film um, based on a book that's called The Unwomanly Face of War, an Oral History of Women in World War II. And he was talking about, he talked about an interview um, with Vulture about how So often, and this is very true, so often we don't see women in war. We don't see what their lives are like. We don't see what it's, you know, Mm -hmm. their experiences. And he really wanted to show that. And he, you know, especially at this time period, and especially for Russia, he says that so often there are films made and and they don't, they don't feature women at all, you know, when it comes to war. So he really wanted to give, you know, voice to that and to show that story and that experience. And I think he really nails it. And he nails how how you can survive like you physically can be okay but you're just like broken and destroyed inside from all of the horrible and awful things that you've endured and experienced and sometimes you're just kind of on autopilot just trying to get through these awful things and then afterwards that's when you deal with all of the you know ramifications of that and this film so eloquently just articulates that and and that experience. And I felt like I was nauseous the entire time I was watching this. And so, so it sounds intense. Yeah. And it, I mean, it sounds like a horrible experience. Cause like, you know what I'm saying? Like I wanted to vomit. I felt nauseous, but it, it, it is such a, an experience to watch this and to see. And if you can get through it, it is worth it to see, you know, these, this, the story, but it is, whew, it is brutal. Hmm. Well, you said dead child, so. Eh. Yeah, I know you're out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is hands down one of, probably one of the most horrific scenes I've ever seen. And not because, and it's, and the thing of it is, is it's not gory. It, it's very, ta- I hate to say tastefully well done, but it is, but it's just, obviously what's happening is just so awful to comprehend. That it's just, it's, oh, it's, it's just devastating. Sounds like it. But yeah. It sounds like if you have the strength to make it through, you'll reach a reward on the other <laughs> side. Yes, yes. It's a very well done film, but it, yeah, it's a hard, hard road to traverse to get there. Yeah, <laughs> oh boy. 
So what's what's beanpole? What is that in the significance oh, of the plot? Oh, sorry. Great question. I love that you asked that. I can't believe I forgot that. So um, Ia is ridiculously tall. Like she's six feet, six five, something like wild. So she towers. Wow, that's very over. tall. Yeah, she towers over everyone. Um, and her nick and and Masha's nickname for her, as well as some other people call her it too, but Masha's nickname for her is beanpole. Um, yeah, and that's hmm. and that's the significance of that. Um, yeah. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me, that reminds me of these brothers that I went to high school with, uh, oh. the older brother they called tree and the younger <laughs> brother they called sapling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's so like, there's so much more I'm thinking about it and there's like so much more, like there's kind of potentially some queer overtones and there's, there's more about these women's lives, but the, the, there's just like so much that, that we could unpack that I'm, but I'm just going to stop there because I think that gives a good overview of, of the film. And it's, it's, yeah. Anyway, I feel after I watched it, I felt like I needed to take a nap. I didn't take a nap, but I felt like I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I could see needing a, needing a respite or, or a change of pace or something to kind of break that mood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a lot. I find when I, when I am in that situation, I, I go for, uh, generally the Muppets can make me feel better. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not going to do the Muppet theme though. I'll, I'll spare you. <laughs> do, 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 do. That's not the Muppet theme. That's the Menomina. But Menomina is so Very good. musical mood today. Yeah. It is. Oh, my God. Speaking of sidebar, very quickly, I watched um, Rainbow Connection the other day and I saw my face off for the umpteenth time anyway. Oh, yeah. That song gets Why me, too. Are there are so many songs ah! about rainbows. Rainbows. <laughs> Are there a lot of songs about rainbows? I mean, aside from Somewhere Over the Rainbow, are there? I mean, that's a pretty big one. So many songs. Mm. (laughs) Not so many song. I mean. I think there are, but I just can't think right now. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, we should probably move on then. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about bad education. I just want to say I don't give a damn about this bad education. Ha ha. (laughs) Ha. Yeah, that song was in my head the entire time. Anytime <laughs> I think see. bad education, that's what I think. Nice. And I feel like in a way that's probably what they were going for, but not really because there's, not, <laughs> there's nothing to do with that in this movie. No, no not um, to, to Joan Jett at all. <laughs> no, this is one of those HBO based on a true story kind of uh, movies that they like to do. And uh, it involves a pretty big public school scandal uh in terms of like in millions of dollars that were embezzled the imdb summary says it's the single largest public school embezzlement scandal in american history which i believe it's something to the tune i think they say at the end of like 11 million dollars <laughs> <laughs> that was embezzled between the two people who in this film are played by allison janney and hugh jackman um wow there's stuff I liked and there's a lot of stuff that I didn't oh, like overall. Okay. I felt like this movie was very slow. There's some very strange shot choices. Like there's a couple times where we're looking at someone's midsection and I don't really understand why they decided that was a good shot to linger on. Um, oh, I, I want to have a whole discussion about the shots. Cause I actually think the shot choices were great. Uh, we can get to that. Yes, we will definitely get to that. I thought this could have like, so it makes sense to focus on the administrators and, and what they're doing in their, their cover up. But I feel like this also could have been even a more compelling film if it focused on the student that kind of uncovers this mm-hmm. uh, embezzlement and blows the lid wide open on this through the student paper. Like the student paper is what, is what causes their downfall. And I think that that is amazing mm-hmm. because it's like there's this amazing moment toward the beginning of the film where our young reporter is going in to talk to um, Alice and Janie's character and she's not available. So Hugh Jackman, who's the superintendent talks to her and she's like, well, I'm, you know, I'm writing this puff piece about this new addition they're putting on the school. And he's like, you know, 
no no piece has to be a puff piece like you can make it into something serious <laughs> so it's like his own advice is his downfall yep, which i think is against amazing. him yep <laughs> <laughs> he was too inspirational yeah. for his own good <laughs> i know i know but yeah this movie it focuses on the administrator specifically on hugh jackman his character in in all this and He's the kind of guy who at first he seems very kind of like wholesome. He's like, a, you know, my wife passed away. I'm not going to date anybody. I'm a clean eater. I'm, you know, I don't want to eat carbs. Like one of those kind of people, like I'm going to go to book club and like, I'm going to, you know, be involved in the community and feel like there's really wholesome reasons for me to like be doing so well and have a school district that's like in the, what did they say? Top four in the mm-hmm. country or something like that. Yep, He got them to four number four um and so you're like okay and and like you find out about the alice and janney embezzling money and like for me at first i didn't think that he would be involved in it like i thought it would be a situation oh man because i watched so i watched a trailer for this and based on the trailer it made it seem like this was a situation he finds out about after the fact and then is doing all this damage control Mm -hmm. but then when i saw the movie i'm like okay yeah like this couldn't have gone on under his nose without him knowing. And then we, we find out is that he is equally involved <laughs> in the embezzling. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we find out a lot about how he has presented one version of himself and is, has got a lot of other stuff going on under the surface. Like the whole dead wife thing is, seems like a ruse. Like he has a picture on his desk. They don't actually verify whether he had a wife who died, but you find out that he has a partner who he's been living with for a very long time. Uh, but then also he has this boyfriend in Las Vegas, who's like a former student of his. And that's one thing I don't love about the movie is that they kind of like treat his sexual orientation as part of this like deceptive piece and, like, the fact that he doesn't share it with people, like, I think it's his decision, but I mm-hmm. don't think that makes him, like, more deceptive. And I think that's no, one of my problems all. with the movie is that, like, it treats it like a salacious thing. And it really does focus a lot on him as a character with regard mm-hmm. to vanity. Yep. And, like, his character is, like, you know, dabbing his eyes with supplements and he gets a facelift later in the movie and uh it just it really plays on the vanity and i wonder if that's a trait that this person in real life had or if it's like a thing that they invented because i feel like if it's a thing that they invented it feels a little bit unfair to this person to like foist that on them as a character trait just because the movie seems very judgmental of it in a in a in a way oh the movie so that's what i'll say absolutely <laughs> judgmental about his vanity and i'm saying Hugh Jackman's vanity as Dr. Chazone as a character, not the real person, because I have no idea mm-hmm. if the real person is is like that. And to me, it honestly doesn't – I'm going to say this. It honestly doesn't matter because I'm only judging it based on the film. I know other people will watch this and think it's a documentary, and even documentaries are obviously biased. But sometimes when when films are you know obviously based on true stories, people are like, oh, well, that's what really happened. And it's like, no, this is a fictitious version of what happened, obviously. Right. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So – yeah, it definitely is critiquing his vanity, which is – so I I feel two types of way about this and I feel torn because I think critiquing vanity is really an interesting, fascinating topic, mm-hmm. particularly with aging and particularly with men because you don't see a lot of vain men – obsessing over like putting on eye cream, getting facelifts, like the way you do women in media. So I think that that is really Mm -hmm. compelling. However, it's incredibly bothersome that they're tying – like you said, Evan, just tying deception and I would also throw in vanity with his being gay. And Mm -hmm. that is incredibly problematic. And I don't think it's intentionally done, but at the same time, I would argue, and I don't know, but I would argue these are probably straight people who made this film and probably not queer people who made this Mm -hmm. film. Because I feel like if that was the case, they would have made that distinction much more separate. Like this is this person who's vain and having this problem and not all gay men. Right. And there's definitely a line. So Ray Romano is in this and he plays the um, head of the school district or not the head of the school district, the... um, what is his his title he would be like head of uh, the trustees or something like that yeah the, the school board or something like he, he you know he he's in a very prominent position and he has a conversation with hugh jackman's character where he he makes a comment 
that is a negative comment like oh who are you kidding with this who are you fooling with all this like pretty boy stuff mm-hmm. basically is what he says to him and it, i think that the in the that comes off as very judgmental and in, in a way that wraps it around to sexuality mm-hmm. so i don't know if that's the film or the filmmakers necessarily being mean but it just or the character it's but it definitely it feels icky <laughs> and it, it felt icky to me hearing that line yeah no i i will definitely agree with you on that um i don't want to say it besides that but taking that out for a moment which is you know almost impossible to do but i will say what i found fascinating about this film and i i actually liked this film what I found really fascinating about it was, and I mean, I, lo- I, I've told you guys before, I've said it on the show many times. I love Hugh Jackman. He can do no wrong. I think he's a brilliantly talented actor. And what I love about his portrayal of this and this character is his usage of manipulation. Like he is so mm-hmm. masterful at it, so slick, so smooth that when you see him manipulating people and you see it pretty much right from the start, that He's just so good at getting people – like, he threatens people without it seeming like he's threatening people at all. Like, oh, yeah. He's just trying to be very helpful and he's just being a nice guy. And so mm-hmm. I think for me that's what – because I did not watch the trailer as I tend not to watch trailers. And I did not – know I was not familiar – super familiar with this story – that's why that was kind of the tip off to me that I was like, oh, there's no way in hell he did not have something to do with the embezzlement or have his own embezzlement because he's basically manipulating and controlling and he's basically manipulating yeah. people right from the start. So I'm like, yeah, he there. works very, he works very hard to contain the yes. situation. Yes. So like when they find out about Alice and Janney, he's like, all right, let's quickly get a number to this. Like, and let's just call it $250,000 that she stole. And like, let's you know have her dismissed quietly and then we'll like you know have it sorted out with her like let's not go to the authorities on this he he yeah he works very hard to kind of not sweep this under the rug but like give the illusion of dealing with it without actually really dealing with it Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah and so i found that really interesting i found his handling of situations and his the way he moved through the world very intriguing to watch um, but I want to talk about the camera work because it worked for me. There are some weird choices, but I actually like the weird choices. I want to hear more about what you didn't like. Or was that pretty much it that there are weird shots no, of like midsections? <laughs> yeah, the weird midsections. That was really it. I mean, I would say on the whole that I, I did like this movie, but I feel like I didn't love it. And I think, yeah, it's some of the stuff that I feel kind of complicated about, but then it's also like the whole end to me where it's just like his daydream about like uh, going to the assembly where they're congratulating him for getting the school to number one in the country. I'm just like, I don't need to see this. Like this story is done to me. <laughs> okay. Well, wait, I want to table that because I want to get to it because I want to get back to the camera work because it didn't talk about mm-hmm. that. <laughs> and I yeah. want to talk about that end because I actually absolutely love that ending. <laughs> so I love that we're disagreeing on this. Um, so, the, <laughs> so the camera work for me, I don't actually, and it's funny, I'd have to go back through my very copious notes or just rewatch the film altogether. But I actually don't remember any shots of straight midsections. What I remember are a lot of shots of hands because he's very much watching hands because he, that comes up later when he's like looking at hands. He looks at um, necks because he's looking at Alice and Janney's niece's neck when, and, and he uses that against her because he knows the jewelry she's wearing comes from Lord and Taylor and he can very subtly threaten her. Mm-hmm when she tries to blackmail him and she and and he knows that she bought that jewelry that she can't afford as part of Alice and Janney's money that she embezzled. So I think that's actually what – and like I said, there very well could be a midsection shot. I'm not sure. Um, but I really liked the, the camera work on hands. I also liked that we are throughout the film getting shots that are pointed up at him to show his power, to show that he's in control, to show that he can charm. And that, and there's a scene where he, after Alice and Janney is caught, when he's trying to contain it in the room, when he's talking with the other school board members, every single shot is up tilt towards him until the moment when they finally are on board with him and then the camera's level. So you're like, oh, he's won them over and this is just visually re- reifying that. But what I love mm-hmm. is the reporter 
who blows open the whole case, you know, who's like a junior or a sophomore. I love that when their confrontation outside the school, the camera is absolutely level from the start. So you know on a so sub- even though you may know this already, you know this on a subconscious level like, oh, they're equal. He cannot manipulate her. He cannot get anything over on her, or charm her. He can't use his usual tactics because she's not going to fall for it and she's not going to cave. And I love that. And I love that the two of them are going head to head. And also, I love that the coda also at the end of the film says that before the New York Times and any other publication aired the story, the school newspaper was the publication that broke this mm-hmm. story wide open. And I just love yeah. that. But you're right. I would have liked to have seen more. I mean, I think we get a lot of her, but I would have liked to have seen more of her process mm-hmm. and more of her research and kind of more. But I also love the scene where she's like, I'm going to find out where this biller, you know, this this contract uh, company, you know, that I can't call and get a hold of. I'm going to find out what they are. And she goes to the address mm-hmm. and then that's when she finds out that it's a luxury apartment complex or building. And she sees Hugh Jackman and she try and she like, they lock eyes and she like runs away. Like, I just thought that was a, a really good scene. Yeah. You find out that his partner is living in that apartment <laughs> and he's been taking money for quote unquote, like printing costs or some shit like yeah. that. Um, but about the end, because I, I know you just said that you didn't like it, Evan. I actually loved that because I thought that the message of vanity and needing adoration and accolades and craving that, which he clearly so did, I love that that is still happening for him. Like he just can't shed that desire for – everyone to adore him. And so that ending just really worked for me. I love that it's surreal and it's different. And yeah, I really liked that tremendously. I'm I'm glad. (laughs) (laughs) To me, it just just didn't feel, it felt like the rest of the movie was pretty grounded. So seeing something that was kind of like more surreal at the Mm -hmm. end, what didn't gel for me. And like, also just honestly, I don't care. Like, I don't care what that guy's (laughs) thinking about because like, like, we've seen his story, and to me, his story is over. It's like, mm-hmm. he went to prison, and that's, I don't care about him <laughs> because I only care about what he was doing in this point in his life through the movie. So, See, think- anyway, that sounds harsh. but <laughs> No, it's so funny because in, in other films, and, and that's the thing, like, I don't want to care about him either, and I don't really care about him because he's an asshole, but in this film, and perhaps because it's Hugh Jackman and because I think it, he plays this character so well and with so much nuance I was like and I'm watching this and I'm like I don't want to give a fuck about what he cares about I don't want to care I don't want to feel bad for him but I did I you know even though I hated that I felt bad I did feel kind of bad for him in that moment but it's interesting because in other films where we follow you know a villainous person or you know a shady person's journey you know maybe I wouldn't give a shit or maybe I wouldn't care and so I Mm -hmm. I did I, I did find it really interesting that it ended in that way. Um, and also it was great to see the reporter that she becomes editor in chief, like gay for her. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I do agree with you that it would have, it arguably would have been nice to have maybe some other nod that it was going to, you know, kind of go an unrealistic route for its finale. However, I will say one of my absolute favorite film endings is the Florida projects, which is completely surreal at the end. So I, I, for me, this mm-hmm. ending, I this ending definitely worked. But yeah, I love that we have different opinions on this. But yeah, so yeah, sounds like too. I liked it a little more than, or maybe a lot more than you did. But yeah. I completely <laughs> agree with you that it is so fucking problematic when it comes to its depiction of being a gay man and sexuality. Like it's so problematic. Mm-hmm. Ugh, yeah, like good fucking god, it's a mess when it comes to that. <laughs> For sure. Um, I think if you don't have anything else to say about bad education, that we should move on to deer skin. Cause I feel like that is going to have uh, some, <laughs> some interesting dialogue between the three of us. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the one last thing I will say about bad education that I just realized that there was one scene that I found really heartbreaking. And that scene is when Hugh's partner of 33 years finds out that not only has Hugh been cheating on him, But when the Fed is asking him questions on the legality and validity of his marriage, because marriage equality hasn't passed yet, and he's like, stop, don't do this. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. This is so sad. Um, That that actor played that 
brilliantly. And I just love that scene. And I just thought it was really incredibly well done. So I Agreed. just want to add that, cons- especially considering like we're both, you know, you know, criticizing this really harshly on its, you know, depiction of, you know, um, queer sexuality. So yeah, that scene though was, yeah. was masterfully done. Yeah. Gotta, gotta include that scene. Yes. For sure. Yes. But okay. Let's, let's move on. Let's do deer skin. Mm-hmm. Let's, <laughs> For a movie for me, which was a very long 77 minutes. Oh, wow. the floor. <laughs> what? <laughs> More shame. No. Nope. D- disagree. I, I loved this I fucking movie. Me too. I thought it was oh, great. Oh, <laughs> my God. Because I wasn't sure what I was getting into because Jean Dujardin likes to do... He just... He doesn't do the same thing all the time. And it's like, all right, well, what's this fucking guy going to do? And so he he takes off his coat and he puts it in the toilet. And I'm like, what the fuck is this movie? Oh I, know, God, yes. I love that. It's amazing. I know it's about a deerskin coat, but I didn't realize that he's insane. <laughs> and then, mm-hmm. I'm like, right that's the, the first right from the start. And I guess when he started killing people... <laughs> I, I wasn't entirely surprised. I was surprised, but at the same time, I was like, this what kind of follows because he put his coat in the toilet <laughs> and his coat yeah. did start talking to him 20 minutes ago. So <laughs> my favorite thing, though, is how sometimes you can like, it's kind of funny how. So just the the what, the version of this is there's this guy who's in his, I don't know, he's middle aged. He's late 40s. He leaves his wife. He buys this deerskin coat for some reason. We're not sure. <laughs> yeah. And then he becomes obsessed with it to the point that he, he, the guy he buys the coat from also gives him a kind of old digital video camera. So he starts making this documentary about all of these people who he convinces to not wear a coat ever again. So he can be the only person who wears a coat. And then when he starts killing people to make the documentary more interesting, and then he just starts killing people because he likes it. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but it's but amazing. Like, amazing. <laughs> but like the weapon he uses to kill people is a blade of a ceiling fan that he tears down from his hotel room <laughs> and then drives with his car door open, grinding the, grinding the fan blade against the pavement yeah. so it becomes a sword. And yeah, then he I tests it. it by slicing a watermelon in half and then eats the watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you couldn't waste it. And let's not forget when he jams the sword on the top of the car down that lady's head when she's lost and looking for directions. <laughs> I know. I just I remember oh, when she so good. she pulled up and asks for directions, and I was like, "Oh, she's dead." And then I realized oh, yeah. that she had a soft top convertible, and I'm like, "Oh, she's really dead." <laughs> I like actually knew what he was going to do. <laughs> so, oh she's my god, <laughs> this is one of those movies where this is um, now. You could argue this is a short movie where it is a short movie where nothing really <laughs> happens, but I kind of feel like it it just it starts out weird, it gets weirder. It doesn't really <laughs> I've read reviews of it where they're like, This is about document this is about how filmmakers are insane and I don't really think no. it's about that. I think it's just no, about a all. movie it's a movie that is just about a guy who's fucking crazy. And that's fine. Yep. It knows what it it, it is what it is, it's happy being what it is. And <laughs> Jean de Jardin is great. What's her oh, name yeah. for, that I can't remember? Adele. Adele Hanel. From well, it's don't ever French, her so name. you probably don't him. pronounce the H. I mean, I don't know. Okay, fine. <laughs> Adele. Uh, but she's Anel, from but she's, she's from amazing. Portrait of a Lady on Fire, right? Yes, yeah, she is. So and, water lilies. Uh, and she's great things. too. And what I really love about it is her character is this bartender who wants to be a film editor, so she comes on to Jean de Jardin's fake movie. And turns it into a real movie, and then she takes over the movie. Yeah, so, she does. She's a badass. Yeah, love her. I know. I just I didn't see that coming. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh my god, because <laughs> when she said, "I'll get more money," because she's broke and he's stealing money from her, basically, I was like, well, this is not going to turn out well for her. And then she mm-hmm. stole the movie from him. I was like, oh my god, this well, what movie I also, just gets money. Better. She had the power. <laughs> yeah. What I what I also love, right? And that's the thing. It is so. This movie, like I. I think it's interesting that people are saying it's not a, it, like this is a movie not about anything. I disagree. I think this movie is about obsession. It's about control. It's about 
talks mas- masculinity in a way, but it, it, very much about power too. And I love that she absolutely like everything you're saying, Dave, that she is the one in control and she is the one taking, you know, she's seizing power. And I love that. But what I also love is that I was expecting, and I love that this subverts expectations. I was expecting like, oh, once she finds out what's happening or once she finds out how unhinged he is, you know, she's not going to be on board, but no, she's totally on board. And she starts using his language, yeah. like saying like when he's getting the deerskin gloves after he's gotten the deerskin boots and she got him the pants and the hat. And the hat. Yeah, he the took hat off yeah. corpse. I know. I love that. And she's like, oh, killer style. Cause that's the phrase he always uses about his fashion style. And I just love that. I'm like, oh, she's totally on board and she may be unhinged too, which yeah. is great. <laughs> But yeah. yeah. Oh, I loved this. I thought I thought the acting was spectacular. I love how it showcases how obsession unhinges us or maybe you're already unhinged and obsession just, you know, fuels that further. But yeah. I love the use of a horror score, like the single piano key. <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> like, great. It was great. But then when we actually see him murdering people, it's like this jaunty kind of jazzy score. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love the playing with the genre conventions in musical score. Like, I just yeah. love that. I'm like, this is great. That's, yeah, that's I had what I, so much fun with this. Yeah. That's what I noticed. The, um, this, you know, that, that, whatever the, the yes, dirt yes. was, that yes. always happens when the coat starts talking to him or when he's yes. feeling ag- aggrieved in some way. But then when mm-hmm. he's carrying out the coat's bidding, which is to say his own bidding, mm-hmm. it's really happy. <laughs> so he's he's kind of wanted to do this all along so yeah. you know oh my god evan yep. why didn't you like it oh yes i mean come on guys you know my taste at this point how, <laughs> how would you not know that this is an evan this is not an evan movie but you I know mean, like you you have gone you you have liked non-evan movies i agree. that i would have yep. that i would have yeah, but but movies that I would have thought, no, there's no way, and you'd be like, yeah, this movie's fucking great. And of course, I can't remember <laughs> one off the top of my head, but but you, <laughs> you know, know they're there, they exist. We for know sure, it. for yes. sure. <laughs> yeah, but this one I would definitely categorize as not not a me movie. It's just it's weird. It's and I agree with you, Dave. I think it's just weird. Like it's I don't think it's I think to Megan's point, there are themes there, and they are like there is something happening but i don't feel like it was intentional like i feel like just naturally (laughs) through probably not yeah like like naturally (laughs) through the events of the movie we learned uh, you know like we 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 saw subtext that was there but i don't think that that was intentional it's probably not it might not be it might not be i mean i kind of like the idea that this is just a movie about a fucking crazy guy and then the woman Mm -hmm. that he's working with who might also be crazy we're not sure because the way, be. <laughs> yeah, the way she reacts and this, I, you know, I didn't love the ending, but at the same time I thought, oh, I did. I, I loved the ending. But I, that's one thing I did love I'm, was well, the ending. If, if you would let me fucking say something, uh, no. what I thought was, um, I don't really think there's any other way this movie could have ended except him getting blown away by somebody or just killed, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the way that she reacts, how she's kind of startled by the gunshot, but then she's like, oh, this could be cool. And she keeps filming. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like sold. I also loved that it was not only the father of the kid that he threw the rock at who killed him, but he was also the hotel manager. So, oh, mm-hmm. yeah. delightful. Yeah. I love that he killed him with a hunting rifle. Although I have to say, I kind of wish it was just random. Like, I kind of wish it was a person that mistook him for a deer, for a deer. or something and just <laughs> accidentally shot him. That would have been great. Like, <laughs> that would have been, been the perfect ending yeah <laughs> oh yeah the one, the one thing i will say that i kept thinking about because i you know like to ponder and overanalyze everything but i kept thinking like why a deer like deer are the most gentle like lovely like shy creatures they're not fierce and the thing of it is is that when we're introduced to this deer skin jacket like right away when the older man um sells it to him he's like meet the beast and it's like but this isn't a beast like so it's yeah it's, yeah. it's an interesting juxtaposition that we're getting that like you know that this this jacket is enabling arguably his you know ferocious violent side but mm-hmm. it's a deer and they're the most you know gentle creatures so it just was interesting i also want to say there's no way that jacket could have fit the guy who sold it because his torso was so short or so long <laughs> And then yeah. it was also too short for Jean de Jardin. That jacket was made for somebody who wears a thirty-eight short, 
not a 42 oh. regular. So, okay. you know, <laughs> just just an observation. Mm-hmm. Good observation. Good pickup. <laughs> yeah. I, I will say something about the, the, the jacket. I think... I agree with you, Megan. It seems strange that a deerskin jacket would cause someone to... I think it's more about the idea that he's wearing, like, the skin of something mm. else. And, like, oh, that yes. I, that kind of, like, hunter mentality is what yep. kind of turns him into this, like, <laughs> even crazier. <laughs> I don't want to say crazed person because I think he's already crazy to Dave's point about the corduroy jacket in the toilet. And I was like, what movie am I getting myself <laughs> into right now? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, and and also there's um I was going to say that this movie is so French. Um I know that I say that about all French movies, but we only get French movies that are quote good unquote. And what I realized it is about movies where you can tell that they're so French. It's when every character is coiled spring. Like they're all just below the surface, they could go insane at a moment's notice, which is your typical French person. And I know that sounds uh, ter- that sounds terrible to say, but like yes. French people can get angry at the drop of a hat and just start shouting at you, and you have no idea why they're doing it. And this movie captures that perfectly. And now, granted, he is walking up to strangers and being like, hey, what's going on? And he's got a video camera. But literally everyone that he starts filming without their permission within two sentences is like, get the fuck away from you, fucking loser piece of shit. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's that's very a pretty French. normal reaction to me. <laughs> I don't see There's Americans. Some... I don't see Americans doing that. I really don't. Oh, my God. If some creepy stalker is coming up to you. Yeah. I don't know. Well, it depends. Maybe. Depends on the situation, of course. I don't know. There's there's the, you know, the Borat movie when Borat kisses that dude and the guy's like, hey, don't do that. So anyway, let's go over here. You know, so I just <laughs> there's a there's a politeness to uh, to being American that French people dispense with. So, OK. Mm hmm. Um, all right. <laughs> Do you not agree? I yes. don't know. No, I just don't. I, 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 stereotypes make me uncomfortable. <laughs> Any kind of stereotype. I mean, so, it's not yeah. really a stereotype. I mean, the, you know, I mean, they I don't mean, get you're angry. You're talking about all French people, so I'm just saying. I'm not saying you're saying anything bad. I'm just okay. Saying I'm. I'll let. All right. Let's say 75 percent of French people, because <laughs> okay, there, there is always going to be the person who's like, uh, c'est la vie. <laughs> Yes, but there, you are correct that there are definitely, obviously, cultural, you know, norms and mores. So, yes. Yeah. So, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I want to say something I realized while you guys were talking and while we're having this conversation that I that I think speaks to your point that the subtext is absolutely not intentional is in the film when um, Denise, played by Adele Anel, says um, that the that the film he's filming is really about the jacket. And she's like, oh, it's all about how we hide behind a shell to protect us from the outside world. And no, it's not about that. His film is really just about how he loves this jacket and he wants to be the only one wearing a jacket. And mm-hmm. so I think that's kind of, a, you know, potentially meta commentary in the film is that yeah it's really just about this guy and how he's a weirdo um <laughs> yep. this but guy yeah, and I, how he's a weirdo he's yep. a weirdo but i love that this film is so funny like jean de jardin is so funny in this role mm-hmm. and he's so immensely watchable and yeah i just uh i thought this was great i just yeah, yeah. I loved this. I loved how weird it was. I loved that it was funny. I wanted to see where it was going, even though I pretty much had a good idea where yeah. it was going <laughs> from yeah. the start. And um, and yeah. for your sake, Evan, I'm glad it was only 77 minutes. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it was a long 77, but I'm glad it was only 77. <laughs> and I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Because I think there we should we talk about The Wretched. Ah, okay. should we, though? Another movie Another about dead children. Movie. Oh, dead children and deers. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and almost a dead dog. I thought that there was. A, it is a dead dog. The dog got shot. The dog did. But the dog. No, the dog. No, didn't the die. dog. The dog was at the on the pier at the end of the movie. Are hanging we sure out it's with... not a different dog? It had a bandage on. Okay, fair enough. Um, I thought it was a different yeah. dog, but I'm glad you said that. <laughs> there. I, before I, I wanted. I actually made no. I never make notes about movies anymore, which I should because I can't remember character names. Um, <laughs> But one thing I want to note is this is a movie, and I haven't seen a movie like this in a long time, except since maybe Broadcast News, which is a strange parallel to make. But um, the most unnecessary prologue in the history of movie prologues. I know. No callback to it. No explanation for it. You literally could, because then the same thing happens to everyone else, except it just Mm -hmm. takes longer. So... 
you yeah. could have just not had those four minutes at the beginning of the movie or however long that mm-hmm. was. You know, the only yes. thing that it kind of reminded me of was the beginning of it in some weird way. You know, that's so funny that you say that because that was in my notes that this is very evocative of it as well as Hansel and Gretel and many, many other things. But, yeah. you know, what's funny about the the prologue or the opening rather that I, I completely agree with you guys. I think the film would have been tighter and worked better if it had did not have that. The one thing I will say that I think works in its favor for having it is just showing how long the creature has been around, which, again, is feels very it esque. But, yeah, that's that's the one thing I will say about it. Hmm. Yeah, you make a good point, but but, I but think there's that, other ways to do that. So yeah, you know how um in Bram Stoker's Dracula the tagline was "Love never dies." Well, in this movie, yeah. evil never dies. So <laughs> you know, or children eating never dies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there, the, there. So okay, uh, the 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 ten cent tour is that there's this. I'm. Um, I guess it's a witch. <laughs> Yes. There's this witch that eats children mm-hmm. and it can possess, not possess, but it doesn't, because it doesn't possess. It like takes over a, a body. It climbs in something's skin. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like inside a, something. Kind of like an Egger suit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And um, whether it's a deer or uh, the woman who lives next door, who, by the <laughs> way, played the shit out of that part once she oh, got, yeah. I mean, she was good before she got, you know, taken over by the witch, but once she got taken over by the witch, Man, she was genuinely creepy. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah, great. for sure. Uh, so I don't know who she is, but rock and roll to you. After. <laughs> um, so, yeah, a lot of things worked for this and a lot of things didn't. I mean, I think like a lot of horror movies, once you found out what was actually going on, it became significantly less scary. Um, you know, when there's just like children being randomly killed in this, like you see the eyes by the crib, which I, you know, I, that poor baby. He was so cute. Oh. I loved that scene. That's actually my favorite scene in the entire film. <laughs> I know. Well, at least you didn't see him get eaten, you know? I yeah. mean, good yeah. God. Like his older brother, who you do get, <laughs> you do That's see true. getting eaten later. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I but, love that. It feels very much like, you know, kind of paranormal activity or rec where you're seeing things on the camera. And I also love like the the children's toys. Like you, the, when you have the camera at, at the feet and uh, like under the crib and you see like the little like wheels with the monkey on it rolling around, like that felt very creepy, like the, the mm-hmm. toy kind of moving on its own. Yeah, those things I think were great. I also love the claws like crawling out of the deer or crawling out of um, Sarah's body at the end, like towards the end of the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those were things. I loved I thought those things worked very well yeah I even didn't mind the idea that there was that the main character had a little brother that he had been made to forget about by the witch because I was like you know what Mm -hmm. this is one of those things it actually makes sense when you think about it because the the witch makes these parents forget they have children which is how Mm -hmm. she's able to like take them and not get caught which I think is something that they always overlook in horror movies you always like It's like an it. It's like there's all these dead children and no one's up in arms about it. It's like, wait a minute, (laughs) you know, but in this movie, it's like all these children are dead, disappeared, whatever, but nobody remembers they existed in the first place. Right. So well done you. Um, I thought the main guy. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, and there are clues throughout the film. Like, I remember thinking, that's really weird when Mallory, his coworker, um, Ben's coworker, the protagonist, she says, oh, there's no room on your cast. And I thought she was being sarcastic. But no, she literally was serious that there was no room on the cast because his brother, who he's forgotten, had drawn all over it. And I was like, oh, that's mm-hmm. quite clever. That actually, that twist works out really well. So yeah, yeah. I liked that. I thought it worked. Yeah, and I liked how dad didn't get possessed, and I like how uh, I like the way they played that the girlfriend got possessed. Uh, possess- yes. I'm going to use the word possessed because uh, she mentions at one point when she's still herself that she's vegan because of yep. X, Y, and Z. And then later, Ben, the main character, thank you for telling me his name, sees <laughs> her welcome. pouring cream into her coffee, and he realizes she's the witch. And I was, uh-huh. and I was like, yep. "Wow, that's actually really well done. That mm-hmm. the, the this movie is smart enough that it knows the witch doesn't know she's vegan." Um, yes. So that was cool. But here are some things I didn't like. Uh oh. <laughs> the ending, when Mallory has become the witch, obviously, because mm-hmm. every time somebody is, like I said, I'm going to use the word possessed. 
the other two times people are possessed in this movie, you see it happen straight like or it's a little, you know, you see the the mom get um, Sarah get pulled under the crib and then you hear her bones being crunched or whatever it is. And then when the witch is like hanging out outside the the, the marina um, and you see Sarah leave and then the witch is gone, you know, like, oh, Sarah's it's it's over for Sarah. You never see a moment when Mallory and the witch are near each other even that dumb tree. And also Mallory forgets who her sister is, but then she remembers her later. Yeah. Cause we- the photo is burned. That's why. Mm-hmm. Oh, they burned yeah. the photo. That, that's how the memories yeah. came back. Oh, that's, what, okay. that's what allows I them forgot. to remember Nathan, his brother too. Yeah. Okay. See, there you go. <laughs> um, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Well, I didn't catch mm-hmm. the dog wasn't dead. So <laughs> I <Yeah>. hear you. <laughs> Well, but and the other thing is, I was thinking, well, when did the witch have a moment to like possess Mallory? Because Mallory was able to pick up the salt and throw it at the witch. So she wasn't possessed then. There's not two witches. I would think the witch would have had to survive the fire somehow. Well, sure. Like the fire wasn't enough to kill the witch. And it just keeps coming back. There's no real way to kill it. Right. (laughs) It just, it was one of those things where it's like, it's just not, it's kind of cheap. And I wouldn't say Mm -hmm. tawdry, but it is cheap. Um, and then she's on a, you know, a fucking boat giving all these kids like a sailing lesson. And it's like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> so, so that, right. but, but a lot of this movie was actually really well done. I was really yeah. pleasantly surprised, even though the, the idea of dead children was awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not the most pleasant. Um, no. Yeah, I so I have one this and I, this is such a nitpick, but I have one nitpick. So Ooh. I think yeah, it's it, it is a small one, but still it, it kind of it took me out of the film a little bit and then when I read more about the behind the scenes and that the dire- the two directors, um the Pierce brothers who made this, they did a lot of research. And so I'm like that bothered me even more that they missed this. So the film cuz I was like I was watching this and I was like this is I know there are a lot of horror movies about witches and they're usually often incorrect about the mythology or what have you of witches. So I was looking into this one and it's actually based on a, it's, well, it's based on an amalgam of a bunch actually, but it's based on the boo hag in Gullah culture, which I thought was interesting. And the boo hag wears skins of people. And when the skin wears out, it wears another skin and it steals breath. It doesn't, it doesn't eat um, people. It steals their life force that way. And then it's also based on Black Annis, um, who was a witch in English folklore, who does eat children and Ugh. has like uh, claws and things like that. And both of them are, especially Black Annis, is based on Mother Goddess. And it, what's interesting is that when Ben is doing research on the computer of like the symbol, the V with like the the line through it, and some words pop up, and it, and it has it's like the suggested origin of the legend of the slipskin hag that basically is word for word taken from the wikipedia of black anise which i thought was kind of interesting but my my nitpick is that salt does not repel witches if anything witches like the real witches like pagans and wiccans they use salt as part of their altars symbolizing earth so i'm like oh that's irritating to me so I don't know. I wish they had changed the material, but that and that is such a nitpick. But I'm like, ugh. Maybe they should have used sugar. Maybe. (laughs) But especially considering like the fact that Ben is like telling Mallory, like, oh, make this circle. And protective circles are a thing in pagan religions. And you when you cast a spell or what have you, you do a circle. And so I'm like, okay, they're clearly doing their research. They clearly have so many elements correct, even though they're kind of cherry picking, you know, from various folklores and myths. But I'm like, really that? So anyway, that's a that's a nitpick, but it, it kind of took me out of it. But yeah, I agree. I think there are so many things that worked really, really well here. Um, I, you know, I, I, at first I was kind of like, why are we following the neighbor's family and, you know, Ben's and, you know, his drug addiction and, but it, it kind of all comes together. And, and I thought it came together kind of in a nice way. And I like that he forgot his brother and it worked. And so, yeah, there was a lot for me that, that worked. Okay, cool. Evan. <laughs> uh oh, I don't know. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> I, I agree that the twist works really well at the end. I also was found the ending annoying. One of the other things I found super annoying was when he falls and hits his head on the rock and he's like in the woods and wakes up in the woods hours later. Mm-hmm. 
because you're like Wouldn't people you saw him? him run into the woods like they in oh. theory you would think they would have chased after him oh, to find yeah. him and he wouldn't have been laying there in the woods all all day and then they wouldn't be sitting at his house like being like oh where is he i don't know he's missing <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point i was i was thinking like wouldn't wouldn't the witch have killed him <laughs> like why would you yes him well alive? that too that's probably the bigger question is yeah what you, she could just come out grab him pull him in the hole and he's right. dead yeah it's so that part to me was like super annoying in a way that didn't make sense. Yeah, unless although, she was weak or something and needed more children to eat, I don't know. But. Yeah, well, <laughs> you notice the witch doesn't kill anybody but children. She, well, and the the person's whose body she takes over. Yes. But, um, yes. All of the men kill themselves. So, like uh, Sarah's yeah. husband hangs himself. That cop shoots yep. himself in the throat. Yep. So maybe the witch can only eat children and moms. Maybe. Me? I mean, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I yeah, I don't know how else to just. Dis- but I do, no, I, <laughs> I do think that Evan, you have a point that that douchebag who uh, whose boat Ben threw the garbage in probably would have chased him into the woods. You know. Yes. Yeah, you would think people would have chased him. I mean, like that's you know that's a nitpick about the plot, but like. I think the elements that were horror to me worked well, but some of the other story pieces weren't really gelling for me. Like I didn't feel like his relationship with Mallory felt earned in any way when they like go in for that kiss at yeah. the end. Oh, I agree. And like, yeah. he's just kind of a dink around her <laughs> and like, there's no reason for her to even really want to hang out with him. And it also like, if you're friends with somebody, why the fuck would you do what she did with the paper sliding the paper under the door like why would you fuck with somebody like that like if you care about them i just i feel like those elements of the movie to me were not gelling so it was it was uneven but i did like some of the horror pieces and i did think that the twist was well executed Mm -hmm. speaking about mallory it also she weirdly like slut shames another another classmate just kind of randomly because when he's Mm -hmm. um when ben is in the pool naked because the other girl like took his swim shorts off or dare and i'm just like oh that feels kind of weird and out of the blue so yeah so i kind of think that speaks to um evan your point about unevenness uh the another thing that that we haven't really talked about that i thought was kind of intriguing and then i i picked up on it and then i saw in an interview with the directors that they it was intentional so i was like oh that's kind of cool the when the witch takes over the bodies the women change their clothes, like their style changes. Like when we first yes, I noticed that the mm-hmm. mom Abby, yeah, she's like wearing this like rocker shirt and like you know short shorts, and yeah, and then she's wearing all these like very feminine flowy dresses. And like with Mallory too, like I'm like, oh, she's not wearing her grommet belt because I literally have the exact same belt. And I'm like, oh, she's not wearing her Doc Martens anymore. Isn't that interesting? And with Sarah, I'm not sure the girlfriend. I'm not sure if she changed radically, but. It, she may have, but yeah, I thought that was that was kind of a, a nice little touch that they wanted to kind of give a nod to um, the notion of a stereotypical alluring woman because she's kind of like a siren, you know, to men and to children. And yeah, I thought that was that was something there. Yeah, I also yeah, I would, that was something I noticed. I mm-hmm. did too. Um, also, that that shot down the stairs when um, the uh, the rock chick mom, who's then wearing the nice flowing dress, is standing. <gasps> outside the screen door and she's yes. like telling Ben blah 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 and then she says to him how would you like it if I snap that other arm and I was like whoa <laughs> this shit That's is getting great. serious like right now yeah I was mm-hmm. kind of amazed by how nonchalant Ben seemed about I mean, at the same time, it's like, what are you gonna do but then he does go ahead and be like she's evil there's a thing in the cellar um <laughs> I also liked, by the way, you know, the the parents in the movies always don't believe their kids until it's too late. But I like the fact that some, I don't remember even what it was, but Ben said something that stuck with his dad. And he's like, you know what? I am going to go down in the cellar. And then <laughs> there's nothing in the cellar. But then, ooh, there's a light on upstairs in the, you know, he see, oh, he sees the husband like sleepwalking into the thing. That's what it is, into the barn mm-hmm. or whatever it is. And then he finds where the witch has smart enough moved the altar but not far enough 
So <laughs> I also like how the witch is like smart, but she's not a genius. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, she's fallible. She makes some mistakes. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, overall, I I, I had fun with it. I, I would say you know I would recommend. I also appreciated that it was actually rated R. It bugs me when so many horror movies now are PG-13. So I appreciated that this was just like, yeah, we're going to go for the gore, even though it was against <laughs> children. So And deers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, and I also loved, like you were saying, how they researched the whole thing when the, when the skin didn't fit anymore, the witch got rid of yes. it, which is what mm-hmm. she did. But there's that great yeah. scene where she's trying to fix the skin under her eye and she can't, yes! so she puts on a pair of sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yep. it's just what arnie does in the terminator it's perfect so <laughs> yep another film yep. about vanity <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i cool. agree i think i mean i think there's some unevenness and a few missteps but i think overall i enjoyed this and i thought a lot of it worked well yeah i agree all right so let's quickly quickly oh, recap here. sorry i forgot one go more ahead thing. no 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 it's go fine ahead. it's fine it's fine i can skip it okay <laughs> Uh, so Beanpole is a C. We would say, yeah, I think bad education. I would probably say see it. Yeah. I mean, um, it's definitely got some problems, but I would say see it too. Yeah. It's really well cast and I, I like everybody in it. I think they, they all give great performances. I would never recommend Deerskin, but I, I can <gasps> tell that you guys would. <laughs> <laughs> I would highly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, and then obviously we were saying see see the wretched. I feel a little more lukewarm about it, but uh, yeah, I, I see its positive. I see its strengths. It, it's not a hard C, but it's a C. Yeah, yeah, I would uh, I would say see it. Cool. So that brings us to the end of another thrilling episode of Spoiler <laughs> Peace Theater. Uh, you can find the show any place you can get podcasts but you can also get in touch with us a few different ways we're on facebook we're spoiler peace theater we are at spoiler peace on twitter and on instagram Uh, you can send us an email spoilerpeace at gmail.com and you can also give us a call 86221peace you can uh, leave us a message and uh, tell us what you think. Tell us we're right. Tell us we're wrong. Or just call and say hi. I mean, it's just nice to hear from you guys. And um, also, you're at home anyway, probably. Yeah. I mean, how many of you are <laughs> essential workers? So, you know, just give us a call. It, it might break up the monotony. Yeah, that's true. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs> uh, and also, so if you love the show, please rate and review us on your platform of choice you can go to rate this podcast.com slash spoiler piece it'll take you wherever you want to go so you can rate and review us and um if you really really like the show uh mm-hmm. head over to patreon.com slash spoiler piece and sign up for our patreon uh for as low as five dollars a month you can sign up to receive exclusive audio from us you can vote in polls for 10 bucks a month you can tell us movies you want us to watch and it's it's really awesome, and we really appreciate the those of you who are patrons and have continued to be patrons because we know this is not exactly the easiest time uh, right. to to be giving money. So we really really appreciate it, and uh, you should listen to this week's exclusive audio where we're talking about the film School Ties, uh, the winner of our high school film poll. Woo-hoo. So definitely check that out. Uh, So my name is Evan Crean. I am co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. I'm co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. And you can follow me on Twitter and on Letterboxd as Real Recon. My name is Megan Kearns. I'm editor of Bitch Licks. And I, too, am a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. And you can follow me on Twitter at OpinionSWorld and on Letterboxd and Instagram at TheOpinionS. And my name is Dave Riedel. I am a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd as Dave Sees Movies. And we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.